All right, so um, as Don mentioned, this was the one answer he got right. Uh, <laughs> nano server to full server to server core. So basically, uh, oh, now they arrive. Look at this. You stop taking questions and they come. Okay, yeah, you missed out because uh, they. Just a real quick refresh of the rules for folks who have just joined us. Mr. Schnover is answering questions. We have some preloaded questions in the queue. That's what's up on the screen. There'll be time for more questions, possibly. But it's possible he may need to share some things that have not been announced previously that were scheduled for announcement not here but elsewhere. So know the Twitter, know Facebook, know Google. Put your damn phone away. Keep it under your hat for at least a week so that he doesn't get in trouble and ruin it for everybody. Okay? And we'll find you, and Jason will kill you. This is Jason. Look menacing. <laughs> right? So, re repeat the promise. I'm not not sharing any of this. Okay? Hold, hold that to your heart. All right. Yeah, and for those folks who just came in, this is the Q&A, but you just get the A. All the folks that you got in, we gathered all the Qs. So one of the questions was, hey, uh, we've got this new thing, nano server, and how does that relate to server core and full server? And we'll be able to start with one and go to the other. Well, Don got that right. He said that uh, at the beginning, server core um, uh, was by itself, and you could install server core or full server, and you better get it right, because you got it wrong, you clean slate that machine and start over. Uh, same thing, and then in 2012, uh, we did the extra work to be able to go from one to the other and go back and forth. And so it's gonna be exactly the same model, and that's not because that's a good model, it's because to do that is really, really hard, and we didn't do it. Um, so in the beginning, you'll install nano server or server core server with the GUI, and then you, uh, and you better get it right, because if you get it wrong, you got a clean slate, do the other one. And then over time, you'll see that we'll do the same thing. Nano server will be the basis of everything, and you'll be able to go up and down the stack. So that's that one. So nano server on the desktop OS, not likely. No. You weren't all the way at the top. Oh, I wasn't. Wow. OK, so desired state configuration for nano server, uh, yes. What you will get, you will get a copy of, you will be able to get a version, sorry, some people, and it might be everyone, will get nano server uh, and the next uh, Windows Server preview at build. I know we are distributing it at build, and I don't know whether, at, at one time build, we gave it only to the people at build, and then the general population got it afterwards, and I don't know whether we're going to do that again, or everybody's going to get it at build at, you know, at the same time. Ignite. It's only one different week yeah. difference. So one way or the other, yeah. within within a within a matter of a month, uh, you, everyone will be able to get access to it. So there's that. And in in that version, uh, DSC will not work. What you will find is there's a very limited set of things that do work. Uh, as if you weren't here for the earlier session, Don made a very good point that this is very early days of the very early days of nano server. Nano server is one of the most important technologies for the next 10 years, but that doesn't mean that we're at version seven of it. We're at version one of it, okay? And in fact, we're at sort of the, not even at the beta of it, we're at the alpha of it, okay? So you're gonna get it, and you're gonna see a lot of things that aren't there. Desired state configuration is not there, however, it will be there. Is that right? Or did we get it in? We did not get it in. Yeah, we have it, but you won't get it. So, so that's why I'm pretty confident it's going to be there. Now, just to be clear, uh, it will be, as you heard, uh, it is a different version of PowerShell. It is a version of PowerShell based upon the core CLR, not the full CLR. So what does that mean? The LCM is written in native code, so all good there. <clears throat> the native code providers are written in native code, so all good there. The PowerShell providers, however, are written in PowerShell, and therefore, if those providers work with the core CLR, core CLR, they're all good. If they require things that are in the full CLR but are not in the core CLR, they will not work. And so we'll go do so scrub that, make sure, make sure as many things work, and where they don't work, it's clear that they won't work. 
terms of nano server partners, uh, uh, that came, if I had to recall, I, my guess is that question came from the chef guy. Yes, that's correct. Uh, our early days, I reached out to the uh, chef guys, and uh, we have Chef, in fact, up and running on nano server. So that's very exciting. And so what that means is that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, nano server will be able to be a full participant in continuous deployment, uh, continuous integration workflow. Uh, that was a great test because we had to get Chef on 64 bits and get Ruby running on, um, on a nano server. And so that's great. So uh, now let's talk about that a little bit. So on nano server, we're really focused in on two scenarios. With server core, we just said, hey, we got a new version of server and we're gonna use it for everything and it's great. Except it sort of wasn't because we didn't have full management and et cetera, and we weren't really clear about who should be on it, and therefore sort of everybody, and therefore it was really hard to pressure the people that were really important versus the people that'd be nice to. We learned from those things. And so with NanoServer, we're focused in on two scenarios. Scenario number one, cloud OS infrastructure. Cloud OS infrastructure. What that really means is, if you're familiar with it, that is actually even broad. What we literally mean in this case is, if you're familiar with CPS, the Cloud Platform Solution, is it, what does it take to run that, the, uh, the fabric of that, on NanoServer? So concretely, it's clustered hypervisors and clustered storage servers. So clustered hypervisors and clustered storage servers for cloud OS infrastructure. So earlier there was a question about uh, DFS. DFS is not really a cloud uh, a scenario, cloud infrastructure scenario. Uh, so it might be there, but it might not. And, and I, don't know that, I don't know the answer. Uh, I know that there are certain elements, that most, very large portions of the storage stack are there. I know there's some components that aren't. And one of the questions is, hey, how important is this to get us that there? And we've, uh, said, we've given the team, if that's critical for CloudOS infrastructure, then it's critical to get there. If you feel that it's not, then do it later. So that's the acid test. Are you important for CloudOS infrastructure? Definition, the hardware we run, CPS, um, uh, Cloud Platform Solution, then yes, or <laughs> no. So that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is born in the cloud applications. Born in the cloud applications. Born in the cloud applications mean probably not the application you have. <laughs> okay, that's literally what it means. And it means uh, people who are going to write brand new applications with a cloud design center. Okay, uh, so if you've got an existing SAP, SAP is not going to run on nano server. It's not intended to run on nano server. We really want to get those new applications that say, hey, I want to run in the cloud. I really need to be small. I really need to be efficient. I need to be fast. I need to be lightweight. I'm probably going to have my storage off box. Doesn't have to be, but probably. You know, it's going to have a cloud design center. It must be managed with a DevOps mindset. So we are not trying to uh, recreate with, with Nano uh, for both cloud OS infrastructure and for board in the cloud applications. We are not trying to replica replicate the enterprise way of doing management, where I walk up to an individual box and I say, fine crafted, turn it into a gentle little snowflake server. No, 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 this is the brutal world of cattle management, right? Where you make everything the same, you number your machines, et cetera. That's why I cannot care, that's why I was joking, I was gonna bet on his job that DSC works. DSC is a critical technology for this. In fact, this is why we started on the DSC path. We started on the DSC path because we knew that this was a critical way to manage things for the cloud. So yes, the answer will be that would be there. Dave Cutler happy, who knows. <laughs> royalty for nano, no, the question was do we have to pay a royalty to Apple for the word nano? No, I, I, I think not. Thanks for asking. Pricing, remember, I mean, but can somebody grab me a water? I'm gonna like dry out. <laughs> and then it'll be bad. Just like seize up like a bad car. Okay, so pricing, well let's talk about this. Um, Nano server is an installation option of the SKUs that are available, okay? 
So there's, I forget what we call our SKUs, but there's a big SKU and a small SKU and this SKU, et cetera. When you do that, you can say, hey, I would like to install what? I'd like to install server core, or you know, it used to be called, you had two installation options. You could install server core or a server with a GUI. Now you'd be able to install server core, server with a GUI, or <laughs> nano server. Now, let me also talk about that. Server core, server with a GUI, those things are gonna change and I don't think you're going to see, fully see the, the, where it's going to go in this tech preview, but you'll see sort of a stepping stone there. Let me explain the problem and then what we're going to do. So we used to call things server core and full server. It was a horrible name, horrible, because it made it sound like full server was a good thing. Full server was not a good thing. Full server was the big GUI with the desktop and all the patching and all that. So anyway, it, it sort of we sent the wrong message to the to the marketplace because somebody could say, "Oh, my application is so important. We require the full server," and feel good about that. When in fact, they should feel terrible about it. And so and so then I I, I changed that and I said, "Well, let's call it server core and server with a GUI." Right? So it's not full server; it's server with a GUI. And, and you didn't, because by the way, because they wouldn't let me call what I wanted to call, right? Server for the idiots that bought the name. So they are getting beat of that, but fine. Um, anyways, so it's called server with a GUI. So now going forward, and if you don't know this, with server with a GUI, if you want to, you can remove, you get full desktop, shell, i.e. touch enablement, touch. I, I don't even you know that. I'm the world's first and the world's only Lead architect for a touch enabled server. <laughs> I'm not terribly proud of that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm very proud of PowerShell. I'm very proud of Nano Server. Being the guy whose who's watch covered the first um, touch enabled server, not a moment of pride. Anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to have server. That's its name, it's server. None of this qualification server core, oh, what's that? No, it's gonna be called server. And then we're gonna talk about the other thing. Uh, what I want it to be is server with a, or you can have server or you can have server with a client, right? Because that's really what we're talking about. You're taking a client stack, <coughs> a GUI stack, et cetera, to run client applications on a server. Now, if you want to run a client on a server, that's fine, but then let's be clear about that. You're running a client on a server. Now, there's two legitimate cases for running a client on a server. One is remote desktop. You run client applications on the server and you share them with some other people. That's a great thing. But to be clear, you're running a client stack on a server. And the other is small business server, where you really say, yep, I'm going to have the client local on this machine because I actually am going to manage this machine because I only got one machine. Okay? Uh, I think we call them business essentials. Anyway, so what you'll see in the tech preview is not that. <laughs> what we're going to have is uh, server and then server with local admin tools. Now, when you get server with local admin tools, you'll log in and you'll see this wonderful new user experience called the command prompt. Uh, now, underneath the covers, all the server tools are there. Uh, you can run server manager, you can run MMC, you can run all those tools, but you don't have the shell and you don't have the explorer. And if you want those things, then you have to add them. Okay? And it's really just our way to kind of signal the marketplace that, hey, you server applications, you third parties, or, so one of the reasons why is you talk to people, you say, well, why can not server core today? One well, of the answers are, well, this third party doesn't support it. Oh, this driver would, except they need a GUI to install it. Well, this application, every now and again, it pops up a GUI. <coughs> now, why do those things happen? And the answer is because we haven't been clear with the marketplace, you really shouldn't have been doing that. Call it server, full server. You should have called it server for the people who are not doing their job well. Okay? Anyway, so that's why we're doing that. Wait for the See, mic. That's okay. I, repeat. I, I, I know this. I've done this before. I know how to repeat questions. <laughs> this is not my first rodeo. 
So the question was, uh, is it going to be command.exe or a PowerShell? Here's the deal. It always has to be command.exe. And the reason for that is uh, PowerShell is an optional feature. Why is PowerShell an optional feature? PowerShell is an optional feature because it relies upon the full.net. And the full.net is an optional feature. It's a very large SIP component. And if you're on server core and you do not need .NET, taking it off is a viable thing. If you take it off, then PowerShell is not there. Now, on Nano Server, we have small PowerShell, which, by the way, we have not named. So call it Nano PowerShell or Core PowerShell. It is a, we don't know how we're going to refer to it. Um, but it uses the Core CLR, which is really quite small. And therefore, it is a mandatory component. Currently, that small PowerShell is not in the other Windows SKUs. That may change, but OK. So that's pricing. SQL on Nano Server, not yet. How's that for an answer? <laughs> OK, IoT. In general, I don't like talking for other teams. So I guess, I guess I'll talk a little bit, but not a lot. So um, when we did PowerShell for Nano, uh, in fact, the way we have uh, seen the way we talk about the, the structures of Windows, but now we all are on a common code base and a common build system. And there's something even smaller than Nano. It's like a building block component called OneCore. <clears throat> and uh, PowerShell runs on OneCore. Now, what does that mean? That means anything, any, any, anything that runs Windows can run this small PowerShell. Each of the teams who deliver something based upon Windows has the option to include it or to not include it, and when to include it and not include it. So my understanding, and I'm going to leave it to them, is that the IO team team uh, is making PowerShell available for their SDK that it's a critical component for all the dev test scenarios. And whether they include it after that, probably best to ask them. But technologically, any Windows component can use, or any Windows SKU, any Windows offering going forward will be able to use PowerShell because we did the hard work to do that. Okay, jump server role. I read the jump server role question. Oh, well, let me take, let's stay. Where are we, how are we doing on time? Let's, let's, so a bunch of this, a lot of people get wrapped up on this question of like, oh, command line versus GUI. Oh, server core. Oh, you can get away from my GUI. How can I get away from my GUI? There's drama around the GUI. Let's be clear. We love GUIs. I've been absolutely consistent on this every single time. We love GUIs. I love GUIs. I just don't want them ever on a server. You want a GUI somewhere else remotely managing the server. Okay, so we've been step by step in doing that, and it's a long journey. And now we're switching gears a bit. Okay, so in the past we've been doing these uh, big uh, WPF GUIs to do remote management or MMC GUIs to do remote management. And now as we shift to the cloud, if you recall what I said in the cloud, it's about managing from anything to anything. Okay, so as part of that, we want people who are running on Macs or Chromebooks or Windows or whatever to be able to manage their servers wherever they are. Okay, so we're switching to a web GUI. Okay, good stuff. Um, web GUI does not. A lot of you think, oh, web GUI. That probably means something bad. That means something not good. Let me show you a web GUI. Now remember, no video, no tweeting, right? Because nobody's seen this. Before. So let's see. Unfortunately, we do not have video or audio here. So I'm going to have to hold the microphone down. Let's see how this works. Create a connection to the nano server machine by providing its IP address and credentials. Once the connection is established, you can see a quick overview of the server properties here on the top and the other tools available for remote management. Here. There is a restart and shutdown button on the top to power cycle the machine. Clicking on all settings link gives
gives you access to other system properties, such as general hardware information. Here we can see that we're connected to a Nano server machine. You can use a computer identification tool to change the name of the machine or the workgroup and domain membership. Users tool enables you to add users to an administrator group. The network tool here can be used to take a look at or configure network settings on the Nano server. There are four performance tools. The first one shows the overall CPU utilization. The next one can be used to look at the network performance on the Nano server. The memory graph shows the memory consumption on the machine. And disk metrics, which are turned off by default, can be enabled to look at the disk performance. Using remote management tools, you can also see the list of processes running on the machine. You can right-click on a specific process to end the process or create a process dump. The dump file can then be copied on the local machine for debugging. Run process allows you to create a new process on the remote machine. And here, you can add more columns to the list of processes to see additional properties. The services tool shows the list of services and their status. You can also right click on a service to see the applicable actions against that service. Using the registry editor tool, you can browse through the registry keys on the system. You can... That's a registry editor in a browser. <laughs> what browser is that? I have no idea. I'm sure a, a wonderful Microsoft browser, but it's your browser of choice. <laughs> also use this tool to modify registry keys and values. Next, this shows the list of roles and features available on the server. Remote server management tools also include a PowerShell console. Did you pick that up? <laughs> Wait for it. Wait. <laughs> the session is connected to a remote run space on Nano Server. This console also features show command. You can browse through the modules available on the machine. Or select a commandlet to see the different parameter sets for that commandlet. You can also enter <laughs> parameter values here and click on run to execute the command. Show command in a browser. Yes. <laughs> Next, we have Device Manager. You can use this tool to see the set of devices. Somebody asked whether new new management things in, in for Nano Server, and the answer is a ton. But here's a great example. Uh, device Manager. Right now, how many people use Device Manager locally, Ro -ro remotely? How many remotely? Yeah, you're all liars. It doesn't work. There is no such thing. Yeah, RDS. Okay, the RDS. Yeah, no, there wasn't one. And so this is the first remote version of that. So here's the great thing. Earlier I had told you we are going to talk a lot about the cloud. And some people are not going to go to the cloud. You should not feel dismayed by this. As, as the things we did to make a great server improve the lives of the people who are on the desktop, so too, the things we're doing to be a great cloud operating system are going to improve the lives of the folks who aren't on the cloud. With Nano Server, we can no longer, oh, just, well, that's a great thing. We should get around to doing it. Because guess what? Our desk device manager here, we've been, this has been on the backlog for a really long time. Yeah, we should do that. And the registry, you know, remote registry. Oh, yeah, we should do that. And each time it's like, oh, yeah, but there are these other things. So let's just do those other things. Because, you know, there's, there's another way to do it. With Nano Server, there is no other way to do it. So guess what? They go above the line. So the point I'm making is that remote management is going to get much better because of Nano Server. Whether you use Nano Server or not, you're all going to benefit from that. On the Nano Server, you can also select a specific device to take a look at details or perform operations such as enable or disable the device. And lastly, we have Event Viewer. You can use this tool to browse through the logs on the remote machine. You can see the list of events under a specific log. 
you also have the ability to modify the list by editing the query to a specific date range or a severity level. You can also export a specific event log to your local machine. In this demo today, we showed you how you can use these tools to manage a nano server. Remote server management tools can be used to manage Windows servers from anywhere and any platform. All right. So that is remote management using the web, but server manager. Hello, everyone. A quick demo of using server manager to manage a nano server machine. Let's go ahead and right click on all servers, add servers. I use the DNS tab, we'll add the machine name, nano server, and GR in this case. We'll add that. Click OK. And you'll notice that we'll get an authentication error. That's because we need to right click and say manage as and enter the credentials we need for the <laughs> nano server machine. That's administrator and the password in this case. Once we get that done, short wait, and then we get an error that says PowerShell not installed. Well, you can ignore that. PowerShell is installed, but that's an issue that we're working on. You'll see services and events. If you scroll down, you'll see performance also missing. That's another issue we're working on. But then you see rows and features, and it has all the rows and features of that nano server installation, Hyper-V, file and storage services, the file server rule, and clustering in this case. Let's click on file and storage services and click on shares and click on tasks and new share. We'll create a new SMB share. How about a custom path, the nano perhaps? And then we give it a name, a description, and we say next. It complains that the path doesn't exist. You want to create it and we say okay. We go next in the wizard and it creates our SMB share. And as you'll see here in the list, it actually added our newly created SMB share. If we go up to storage pools, nothing interesting to see here. We go up to disks, and you see all the physical disks on the machine. Volumes. You, again, this is what you'd expect to see in Server Manager, whether you're managing Nano Server or any other server. Let's go ahead and select File Server and try to remove the role as we do. Right click and say Remove Role Feature. Follow the wizard, look for file server, we have to expand that first tree, uncheck the box, keep clicking next, and then remove. Another short wait, I'm going to fast forward here, and we're done. That was it. You just saw how you can use familiar tools such as Server Manager to manage nano server machines. Thanks for watching. That was her five. Yeah. So if you guys don't know that, um, we've had some, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, great. So Rafat Isa is back on the team, uh, as is Jim Truer. Jim Truer, uh, original co-designer of the language with uh, Bruce Payette. Uh, at some point he lost his mind and uh, went to another team at Microsoft and he was off in the, in the woods for a while there, but we got him back. So we're pleased to have these great guys back at the team. So the point of those two demos were, Hey, Nano Server is fully headless. You cannot locally log into it. That does not mean it's a pure command line experience. It's a rich GUI management experience, right? But it's remote GUIs. Okay, so that's that's the that's the story there. And let's see. I don't know if this is going to work or not. Let me see. This this might go all pear shaped. Okay. Nah, 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 maybe. Okay. So here. Okay, so here's my machine. Oh, let's go bigger. And you see what I got here? So this is managing three machines. This bottom one here is server core. This is nano server running locally. And this is nano server running up in Azure. Okay, so that's actually not accessible right now. So the point we want to make here is that these GUI tools are going to be able to manage your nano server wherever they are, okay? Whether they're locally, whether they're in Amazon, whether they're in Azure, whether you're running them, you know, anywhere, it'll work with this eventually. Okay, let's go back to our list. 
All right, so, so that was the question about the jump server role. Uh, open sourcing windows. Yeah, so there was a funny story about that. <laughs> and that's all I have to say on that topic. <laughs> Rasinovich was on a, at, a, at the Chef Comp the other day, and they had a, had a review, had a discussion about open sourcing. And Rasinovich made the comment, I'll be clear here, no tweeting, but if you do tweet, remember the name was Mark Rasinovich. <laughs> <laughs> Said, you know, um, everything's on the table under the new leadership of Sacha. Indeed, we're re-questioning everything, and everything's open uh, and open for discussion on the table, and that uh, open sourcing windows was a definite possibility. Well, the press picked up on that and went nuts, and the PR people are beating him mercilessly. So, uh, but the, but it's 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 true. I mean, everything is up for grabs, and so we look at these things and say, hey, how does that advance our customers' agenda? Does that help them? Uh, how would it help them, et cetera. You know, the thing I think a lot of people don't quite get is that some of these open source operating systems, it's just a different business model. This is a different business model. Red Hat's not like funded by the Carnegie Mellon Association, right? You know, it's, it's, no, it's a business model. So they just have a, so, so you know, who knows, maybe. Anyway, so, um, will we open source PowerShell? Uh, there's a really smart guy that once predicted that PowerShell would be open source, and I think the brilliance of that prediction stands by itself, and I have nothing to say on that. Although it's worth pointing out, and somebody asked, well, if you did open source it, would you move it to other, other points? Well, let's, again, get back to the motivations, right? You do things not, you know, would you open source Windows? And the point would be, I don't know, what are you trying to achieve? And is that the best way to achieve it? Okay, so I can't answer that question with respect to Windows, but I can answer it with respect to, to PowerShell. There's a couple things that you might want to achieve with, with PowerShell, open sourcing PowerShell. And one of them is, as you know, the connect bugs, right? People file bugs, and we look at those, and we prioritize them, and honestly, it may, it might not feel, may or may not feel like it, but we invest a large portion of our budget, each release, to addressing connect bugs. But I guarantee it doesn't feel that way. I mean, we think it does. We think, boy, if I wasn't doing that, I could do all these other things. Uh, but we do that. But there's basically, because PowerShell is such a large surface area, uh, it's very hard to keep up with those things. Now, the fact that we fixed X dozen connect features over here doesn't help you if you, the one block and use over there. But a lot of people in this room have demonstrated this week that, hey, they have no problem uh, using get uh, making changes to source code. Uh, and so if we were to open source PowerShell, we would uh, enable our community to contribute with us and help prioritize what changes to the product make the most sense, right? Bug fixes, new features, et cetera. So that's definitely something we think about uh, and makes sense, and it's one of the reasons why I predicted at some point we will. Now, Mark Rasinovich made a great point. Let's say there's a piece of code that you said, yes, the right thing to do is to open source it. Doesn't necessarily mean that you can open source it, right? If it requires, he said, I think you said, if it requires a team of rocket scientists to build it, uh, you know, that's a challenge, right? Well, guess what? Windows, it requires like many hundred rocket scientists to, to, to build Windows. Someone predicted, said that we had 16 versions of Perl in, in the build system. I mean, it's a very organically grown thing over many, many years. So, you know, you, you have to be able to build it and you have to allow people to be able to contribute in a way that is safe. Now, what does that mean? You have to have tests, right? If you're working on a subsystem, you know, oh, hey, it's open source, you make some changes. If you push them and break, how are you going to feel, right? You're going to be pretty embarrassed and then maybe you're not going to do that again because everyone's like, yeah, well, hold on, I got broke or broke, broke PowerShell. And so, so what you want to do is you want to say, well, I made these changes and maybe they're good and maybe they're not. Let me run them against the tests. And you run them against the test and they say, yeah, that's a good change. Then you say, okay, great, I can push this with some confidence. And if it breaks, I'll say, hey, you got some crummy tests, but you know, you can do it with confidence. Um, and so you have to have, it has to be able to be built by everybody, has to be able to have unit tests. There's a lot to it. So these things are not, just because you have the will, 
And the vision doesn't necessarily mean you have the pieces in place to succeed, so that's why. Okay, so PowerShell and Docker APIs. Yeah, so <clears throat> with Windows containers, Don did a good job about that articulating the difference between Docker, which is not containers, and containers. Docker is an API to manage containers, and it manages Windows containers, and then we, or sorry, it manages Linux containers. We are developing Windows containers, and we will implement the Docker API, so Docker clients will be able to manage us. So you have a consistent set of tools that can manage Linux or Windows containers, good things. Uh, we'll almost certainly have additional APIs, including a PowerShell way to do things for those people who Docker API is not their native way to do things. Um, and you might hear more about that at Ignite. Okay. Um, let's see, PowerShell certification track, nope. <laughs> and they, the theory behind that is just, uh, we've always felt that PowerShell was a component of a certification not a distinct st skill in and of itself. I mean, it is a skill, but we think that in terms of the way Microsoft works with its certification, there wasn't a good fit with PowerShell. I mean, we could be wrong on that. You can educate us, but that's, that's the way we've been thinking about it. I mentioned the APIs, X serverish model for versus remote management. Well, that was the, the point I've made there. Now, <clears throat> when somebody might ask, boy, if it's, if it's what, uh, you know, almost 20 times smaller, Nano server is almost 20 times smaller than server core, by the way, than server core. Servers, even larger still. Like how, what did you cut to get it that small? And the answer is, I have long been telling people, uh, you didn't get it, right? How expensive it was to be able to run local GUIs, right? That's the deal. That's what you've been paying all these years for the ability to run local GUI. Okay, so we got rid of local GUIs, we got rid of 32-bit compatibility, and we got rid of MSI, you know, basically a number of things associated with those local GUIs. So MSI, I'm thinking I'm missing one other thing. Yeah, we did a ton of refactoring. But that bulk of it was those local GUI APIs. So no, there's no, there is no GUI API. Now here's that it has a ramification, right? Literally, if you've got a, a server component that wants to like build a PDF, you know, generate a PDF, we don't have the libraries, the GUI libraries, to generate those PDFs. So that's not a good role for this right now. Over time, we may refactor that, and et cetera, but right now that's not a, a good case. Uh, what, smell, what is orange and smells like a parrot? I have no idea. I'm just gonna pass on that one. Bits access, I mentioned. Yeah, power, I'm lost. Where am I? Okay, SSH support. Um, okay, so we've talked about this, I think, every single year. That we've always been friendly to SSH. However, the company has not been friendly to open source software. Again, under Satya, there's a new sheriff in town, and we're having the conversation again. And that conversation is very different this time. So I have nothing to announce at this point, but I will say there's a new sheriff in town. So. Uh, Okay, uh, flash, nano, and flash drives. So the answer is yes, it's small enough to run on a little, you know, those SSD cards on a, a motherboard. Uh, we are looking to see whether our boot from USB stack is up to the server quality standards. Uh, yes, you can do it as a Windows to go, you can boot for off a USB drive. That's, that's supported for the client SKUs. For the server SKUs, that is not a supported option. And so we're, we are looking to support that, but currently we're, we haven't said. Uh, Nano and Raspberry Pi. This is really the question of ARM, and uh, we have not announced anything with respect to Windows Server and ARM. As you know, Windows Client does run on ARM. IoT does run on ARM. Uh, PowerShell runs on ARM in those environments. Uh, and we've made no announcement about anything with respect to server and ARM. VI for Nano. Mm, well, but did you see Paul? Where's Paul? Paul, 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 Paul. Yeah, Paul. Have you done your, your session yet? Tomorrow. You got to go to Paul's session. This is a great release for Paul. He's going to have a few of these. Paul at some point did, did the remote debugging. 
And so he does the remote debugging. Have you seen this? You're in ISE and you can remotely debug. It's like it's more than that. You can attach, you can do attach to process. You can get on a remote box and say, show me everything that's run on a PowerShell host. Really, really. Show me everything that's run on a PowerShell host. And then you can connect to that process, see the run spaces, bind to one of those run spaces and break into it and debug it. It's craziness. Anyway, so he's showing this, and then and then on ISC, you're seeing the source code. So what he does is he the script's running over there, he pulls the script over and he runs it. And I said, I looked at it and I said, wait, you just pulled the script over. How'd you do that? And he explains, I said, Well, wait, could you save it? And he says, Well, it's not IO. I said, Yeah, but you gotta set content. Anyway, so now you can do remote script editing uh, across a box. Let's see if that actually works. <laughs> Let's see. PS edit t1.ps1. Oh, and there we go. So you see this, I don't know if you can see this here. Up here, I'm connected to a remote machine, that's the IP address, of, 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 of. Anybody notice that prompt? Oh my lord, what a group of people. Anyway, so I'm on nano server, and I just PS edited this file, and Paul figured out this really clever, are you gonna tell him about the mechanism? I gotta tell you, it's one of those things I just like, how did you do that? And then he showed me the mechanism and it was just so innovative. It uses standard stuff we have in PowerShell for a long time, but he just used it in this wonderfully creative way uh, that gave you this. Anyway, so uh, here you're remotely editing something and if you want to, you can go change it. And save it, exit. Cat it, cat d1.ps1. Wow, Paul rocks. Yeah, good. Paul's having a great release. <laughs> so, 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 no, we don't have a local command line uh, editor, but we do have remote editing now. Again, thanks to Paul. And, and back to the point I was making earlier, to this side of the room, I don't, want, I don't know who, but anyway, that, that PowerShell nano server is forcing us to do a much better job at remoting. So we have remote, uh, remote debugging, remote file editing. We have remote file transfer. Have you heard about that? Have you heard about that? So, so now, you know, copy item, you can say copy item minus two session and copy over PSRP. You can say copy item minus from session and pull files over. You can do that recursively and it actually works pretty good. It's not, it's not gonna replace SMB, but it works pretty darn great. So again, one of those great things. Would you like to interrupt, Richard? <laughs> Can you copy from one session over there to a session over there? Um, I believe the answer, can you copy from uh, session A to session B? And current answer is no. Uh, eventually, yes. And eventually either means for the client release or the server release, and I'm not sure which. But yeah. OK, okay Jim. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you can say thank you. Yeah, you can interrupt me for a thank you. I like that. Okay. Is there anything in that space for a cross-platform story? Uh, oh, is there anything in that space for a cross-platform? So currently, PSRP does not go cross-platform. Oh, okay, by the way, back to the SSH conversation. So why is SSH interesting? <clears throat> and it's back to the cloud story. Cloud story says, we want to be able to manage anything from anywhere. Okay, so we want you, PowerShell users, to be able to manage your Windows and your Linux boxes, right? A lot of people have a mixed environment. So we want to have an SSH client so you can manage your Linux boxes. Then we have people who have, or Linux users, that are, have some of their stuff running in Windows uh, and we want them to be able to manage it. So we want to have an SSH server. So that's the context in which we evaluate that, and we look at it and we say, these things help move our customer forward. It's not about SSH, who cares about SSH? It's about these customer scenarios. So currently we have no uh, cross-platform PowerShell, uh, PowerShell uh, remoting. What we do have is we have PowerShell, sorry, we have PowerShell DSC running on Linux, and that's in beta, and we have uh, OMI, that's our open source implementation of WMI, running on Linux, and if you're not familiar with this, we have 
as you know, I'm not a fan of random REST APIs. Random, you know, just yet another REST API is just some incoherent nonsense that you go and you gotta read all these documents and like, okay, now I figured out how to talk to you. Oh, you did it a different way. Great, how did you do it? Oh, you didn't do it, do it a different way. You're like all solving the same problem in completely different ways. That's why I'm a very big fan of OData. OData is a set of conventions for REST APIs that say, hey, if you're gonna talk about an instance, here's how you describe an instance. If you're gonna talk about a collection, here's how you're gonna do a collection. If you're gonna do filtering, here's how to express filtering. And so it's an ordered set of conventions for performing uh, actions that lots of people do with REST APIs. I like that because then it's orderly and allows us to then point at a REST API and have enough intelligence to be able to then auto-generate a set of commandlets. Now, there's a group of hardware vendors that had sought to replace IPMI with a REST API. And guess what? The original implementation was yet another REST API. You know, okay, so their guys, smart guys, went and did something, but it's completely unique to them. Didn't look like anything else in the world. And so we got involved and we said, hey, let's take this to the DMTF and then let's see if we can't adopt OData. We did lots and lots and lots of due diligence before they finally looked and they said, hey, that looks pretty good. And so now in the DMTF, there's an emergent standard for doing hardware management using OData REST APIs. Now, why is that interesting? It's interesting because now what we were able to show at Open Compute Platform was vendors coming in. This guy had a, his own server. These guys brought a rack of servers with a, a chassis manager. This guy implemented the standard. This guy implemented the standard and a bunch of vendor value-added extensions. What we were able to show was point at the machine that, that implemented the standard, generate a set of commandlets that would manage that machine or that machine using those commandlets. We were then able to go to the machine that had the chassis manager, the vendor value add extensions, and generate a new set of commandlets that lit up all their uh, value added extensions that people could directly access. So they didn't have to put any software in this box to be able to manage them. Um, now, one of the challenges there was, okay, that's great, but this OData, because it has all these conventions, there's a lot of work to be done there. So what we did was we implemented an open source implementation of an OData server. So if you're interested in that, let us know, we'll get you a copy. Uh, and that's, by the way, why that we were successful doing that. Web GUI tools customizable, uh, I don't know, maybe. Nano, ser nano running in Azure, uh, well I showed you uh, the nano server guest running in Azure. Uh, currently, we do not have any production workloads running on Azure or on Nano Server. It's very early days. Uh, oh, so I mentioned to you the two roles: born in the cloud, uh, sorry, CloudOS infrastructure, born in the cloud applications. Born in the cloud applications, we're focused in on ASP.NET, and then we're going to go talk to a bunch of other language runtimes. When dealing with Chef, we needed to have Ruby, so we got the Ruby up and running. We have Python up and running, PHP, we have Nginx, uh, and we're working on others, Node.js, working with the Java guys. Uh, and you, can, you can imagine everyone's pretty excited about this environment, and so we talk to them and say, hey, uh, here's what we're doing, are you interested? Uh, they're all very interested in getting their runtimes up and running on, on NanoServer. Um, Different products preclude, oh, RAM requirements. We have not defined what the RAM requirements are gonna be for nano server. I think server is 512. I think in the demo that Rafat showed, uh, they were running a nano server with 128 megs. Um, and, you know, I don't know, we, have, we haven't decided what it's gonna be, the minimum. Question. Okay. The future starts now, baby. So, by the way, so that's that's actually an interesting point. That is how we're. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, hello, really? Okay. This is how we're positioning it. Nano server is the future of of server. Okay. So, blah 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 blah. Oh, one point I want to make here is, 
as we talk to customers, right? Basically, they said, oh, this, this, and this, and this. Basically, what we said was that the heart of what we heard from customers is they want just the components they need to accomplish a task and nothing more, okay? So then we talk about our, our you know, journey, blah, blah, blah. Now, our cloud journey, here's the thing. In Azure, you gotta understand, <clears throat> Azure has no live migration. Okay, Azure has no live migration. That means if I have to patch the Azure host, that means every single customer goes down. Okay, that's a bad thing. Uh, so patching is really, really, really a big deal for Azure host. So too, we've got, um, uh, and by the way, these very large images, they have to be schlepped around the network, right? Sometimes across geographic regions. That is very expensive on the network, right? So it drives your cogs up, these very large images. Now I mentioned to you CPS, Cloud Platform Solution. Cloud Platform Solution does have um, uh, uh, live migration. However, when we installed this thing, what we found was uh, it took an incredibly long time to set up. I mean, that's one of the jokes, right? Prior to CPS, we didn't have long setup times. You did, but we didn't, right? We, would, <laughs> we were just like installing server on that machine and everything was fine. Uh, you and then us after we set up CPS said, no, actually I gotta set up you know, dozens of servers and dozens of things to manage it and that took an incredibly long period of time, so we really understood the pain there. And I said that we have live migration. Now what that means is that we can patch the host and not affect the availability of any of our clients, because we just drain them off that host, then we patch it, and then we drain it off the next and move things and move the clients around. But the maximum density of, uh, of CPS is uh, 8,000 machines, 8,000 VMs. 8,000 VMs at a conservative two gigabyte per VM uh, means you'd have to live migrate 16 terabytes of data to do a live migration or to a patch of the host. That's, that's bit network bandwidth that you'd rather be delivering, using to deliver service to your customers. So the net of this was we, literally, we need a server optimized for the cloud. Now we're pretty sure you need one too, but I know we need one, okay? So even if you never use it, like we're gonna do this, because we need it. Okay, so now, blah, 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 Results, results. Okay, so number of important bulletins, Goes down, okay, green is full server, pink is server core, and then nano server. So, you know, from 26 down to nine important bulletins. But critical bulletins go from 23 down to two. One tenth the number of critical bulletins. Reboots, almost a quarter of the reboots. Security improvements, far fewer drivers loaded, less than half the services running, less than a third of the ports, or a little bit more than a third of the ports open. Resource utilization, process count goes down about 20%. Megabytes per boot go down by 100 megabytes. And the amount of kernel memory in use, less than half. Less than half the amount of kernel memory in use for nano server versus server core now. Hold on a second. And then, in terms of deployment improvements, okay, if you have a, you might want to like brace yourself against that wall. Yeah, that's good right there. Okay. Setup time goes from 300 seconds down to 40. 40 seconds. Disk footprint gigabytes goes from 4.8 down to 290 megabytes. And VHD size goes from six gigabytes down to about 390 megabytes. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Can I see something for you? Let's see, let me show you one more. 